Mark Schlissel. I'm the university provost, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today to this uh, lecture sponsored by our Middle Eastern Studies program as well as the Watson Institute. Uh, it is a, a real pleasure uh, to witness uh, the growth uh, and uh, excitement surrounding Middle Eastern Studies uh, at Brown. Uh, this has long been an area of great student and academic interest. Uh, many colleagues working on problems of relevance to issues in the Middle East, uh, as well as its culture and history. But the arrival uh, a year plus ago of Professor Bashara Dumani to help head up this program uh, has really marked a turning point in Brown. Uh, the growth and the concentration, uh, a series of subsequent faculty recruitments, and the energy that uh, Professor Dumani has brought uh, to this interesting, important, timely uh, area is outstanding and we're thrilled uh, to have Bashar here with us. Um, I also would like to say in advance of uh, allowing uh, Bashar the honor of introducing today's speaker uh, is uh, visitors such as uh, uh, Dr. Ashwari uh, and topics such as uh, the topic under discussion today is one of the reasons why great universities exist. Uh, we exist in part to provide a forum, a place where people can come together uh, to share their ideas uh, on topics that are interesting, uh, important, timely, and often controversial. Uh, it's very hard for many people to discuss issues uh, in a spirit of openness and, and mutual respect, and that's something that the Brown University community prides itself in, providing that kind of forum. Uh, and we like to think that this is one of the contributions a university can make to society, is the ideas that come from interactions such as the ones we'll have today, uh, hopefully will fuel future progress. Uh, many people uh, view prospects for peace uh, in the Middle East uh, as almost impossible prospects. And I, I've said to many uh, others, um, whenever I get really depressed about the prospects for solving an important problem in the world, be it uh, peace uh, and justice in the Middle East, uh, nuclear proliferation around the world, seemingly uh, amazing challenges where we can't see a way to the end line. I think about what happened during uh, my formative years of watching the Soviet Union basically fall apart without anyone dying. And if something like that could happen, if the wall can come down in East Berlin without blood on the hands of the people tearing it down, anything is possible. Uh, so it's in that spirit that I introduce Bashar Damani to introduce our speaker today. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Provost Schlissel. Uh, welcome, everyone, colleagues, students, honored guests. It's a privilege and an honor and a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, who's talk today, titled Oslo Process versus Peace, launches a series of events organized by Middle East Studies around the 20th anniversary of the Declaration of Principles, which was signed the West Lawn of the White House on September 13, 1993. The Oslo Accords, as they became known, are based on the principles of mutual recognition, the formula of land for peace, and a two-state solution for the Palestinian Israeli conflict. Since then, the peace process has become a household phrase and synonymous uh, for U.S. policy in the Middle East. However, 20 years and countless rounds of failed negotiations later, none of the key issues have been resolved. Instead, the pace of Israeli settlement of Palestinian space and lands went into overdrive and all but foreclosed the possibility of a viable Palestinian state. The peace process, as a result, has been pronounced dead over and over again, and yet continues to be the preferred mechanism for the United States government to deal with this important issue. Hence the title of the series we're putting on this year, Oslo is Dead, Long Live Oslo. Our goal is to open a space for informed discussion and creative thinking about what happened since 1993 and where to go from here. The idea is not to play the blame game or to see who shouts the loudest, but to examine what is going on on the ground 
to think outside the peace process box and explore new lines of inquiry that go beyond the, well, there are two sides to every story and leaving it there. Tomorrow you're invited to a panel, discussion titled After Oslo, Critical Conversations on Palestine Israel. Dr. Hanan Ashrawi will participate in this discussion along with five Brown faculty at 5 p.m. tomorrow at the Watson Institute. And check out our website for many other events coming down the line this year. Now, Dr. Hanan Ashrawi uh, is an acclaimed Palestinian leader, legislator, activist, and scholar. She's the first woman to be elected to the Executive Committee of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the highest executive body in Palestine. She's also an elected member of the Palestinian Legislative Council since 1996, and previously served as the Palestinian Authority Minister of Higher Education and Research. Dr. Ashrawi also served as a member of the Leadership Committee of the First Intifada. Those who lived during that period know how important that was and an official spokesman for the Palestinian delegation to the Middle East peace process, beginning with the Madrid Peace Conference of 1991, which preceded the Oslo talks and the courts. She is primarily, however, a civil society activist. In 1999, she founded Miftah, the Palestinian Initiative for the Promotion of Global Dialogue and Democracy. That same year, she founded the National Coalition for Accountability and Integrity, AMAN, which keeps a close eye on the Palestinian Authority and its institutions for possible abuses. Moreover, she is the founder of the Independent Commission for Human Rights, ICHR, and has served as, as its commissioner since 1991. Thank you. Dr. Ashavi received her PhD in comparative literature from the University of Virginia and then went on to found and then chair the Department of English at Music University and then become dean of the Faculty <coughs> of Arts at the same university. She's a recipient of a number of honorary degrees as well as distinguished awards in various international and local organizations and universities. That's the conventional introduction. But to really understand who Hanan Ashrawi is, allow me to describe her house. <laughs> Centrally located near downtown Ramallah, about a kilometer north from Al Manara, the circle, on the way to Museum University, and exactly across the street from the Tuggard compound. Tuggard is the name of a British colonial official who designed these almost impregnable fortress like administrative compounds in the colonies of Britain as a place to rule the colonies. And Palestine, like India and elsewhere, had its covered buildings, and the one for Ravala is located exactly across the street from her house. It has high walls, steel, concrete, uh, very imposing, with a prison inside, intelligence services, administrative offices, and so on. It's a seat of power. And right across the street is Hanan Ashrawi's house. You can't really see it from 50 feet away because it has such a rich and lush uh, and thick vegetation, mostly flowering plants and fruit trees all around that you can barely see the building itself. And when you enter, you realize that there's a big metal and glass gate right in front of you. And you open it and you see a beautiful foyer with stairs going down to the main floor because the house is on a edge of a hill with a steep grave. It's almost like going into a sanctuary, and that is exactly what, is, what her house was. Countless number of Palestinians, mothers, brothers, sisters, fathers whose child was arrested or shot, would first go to Hanan Ashrawi's house to say, what do I do? There, she hooked them up with lawyers, found ways to take care of the emergency, brought the whole network to bear to help these people, uh, walked them through, really, a very painful and difficult process. And this mushroomed into many evenings of music, 
an art uh, of <coughs> discussions about politics, of gatherings between people, and many NGOs were founded in that space. <laughs> uh, the first leadership of the Intifada and many other organizations, people, and of course, folks from outside the country came in and got to know this house right opposite the Tuggard building, the imposing compound of power, as the house where truth speaks to power. Hanan is a voice of that truth speaking to power, an articulate, honest, informed, and passionate voice that we are so proud to have among us today. Please help me in welcoming Hanan Ashrawi. Thank you, Shara, for such a human introduction. I think this is unique. I've never been introduced by a close friend and somebody with whom I shared such a significant history as families, as activists, as academics in, in Palestine. And I'm very proud and honored to be here. And I would like to congratulate Brown University for bringing uh, Shara Dumani on board. I don't know what, whether you knew what you were getting into once you <laughs> recruited him, but I can assure you that the university will never be the same, and for the better. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me. I'm grateful for the opportunity to address you. Thank you all for coming this, this evening. And I would like to thank in particular Barbara Oberketter, Right? Did I pronounce that right? Oberkette? Where's Barbara? For being just so meticulous, so efficient, and uh, for taking care of everything, all the details. And uh, my office director, Margaret Hussari, who's not here with me, but who's worked with Bra Barbara to get me here. This is not the first time I'm uh, a guest at uh, Brown University, but to me, every time I come here, it's a special occasion. Because this is a place, as you said, where people can speak openly, where you can have a free exchange of ideas, where you can challenge complacency, and where you can dare think outside the box, and where you can dare to be human, which is something that not many people are in, in our part of the world. The topic certainly is timely, and not only because it's been 20 years since the signing of the Declaration of Principles, otherwise known as the Oslo Accords in, on September 13th, 1993, but also because it's 22 years since the launching of the Madrid process, the Madrid talks, which began in October 1991 and later became the Washington talks, which were taken over by the uh, Oslo talks. And it's been 25 years since the Palestine National Council, of, uh, which is our, our parliament in exile, adopted the two-state solution in 1988, November 15, 1988, and declared and issued a declaration of independence. That was the time in which the Palestinian leadership, the PLO, in exile, accepted UN Resolution 181 for the partition of Palestine, and then subsequently accepted 242-338 which deal with the 67 uh, boundaries and which later became the terms of reference of the uh, peace talks. Land for peace, right, the two-state solution, 242338. But this occasion is part of a continuum which began in 1947-48, leading up to 1967. I don't want to take you back to 1947-48, but this is, not just an arbitrary date, it's a specific date because it signals the fact that the Palestinians have uh, made, decided to make a historical compromise and accepted the existence of Israel on 78% of historical Palestine with the stipulation that the remaining 22% would be the territory for the Palestinian state, an independent state. It is significant also because we see more attempts these days 
at launching negotiations one more time. John Kerry is talking about getting the two parties together. You have to have the courage to negotiate. We need more negotiations. Well, we have been negotiating for the last uh, 22 years, and what do we have to show for it? My fear is that we are in danger of repeating the mistakes of the past, and we've cautioned anybody who wants to restart these talks not to do the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result. Because we've seen what the price of the Oslo process has been. And we've seen the flaws and the deficiencies work themselves out in a way as to undermine the chances of peace. So our question today is, has the Oslo process run its course? Is this the end of the two-state solution? And ironically, has the Oslo process destroyed its very objective, the two-state solution and hence peace. Now, we could talk with immaculate hindsight, of course, having lived through it all these years, or we could talk about the fact that it was predictable. Many of us did talk about the flaws and the weaknesses. It was a predictable outcome, because there were, as, as we said, structural, procedural, substantive, and even contextual constraints and weaknesses that plague the whole process and uh, that led us to where we are. To me, it's an ambivalent anniversary because, I mean, I, I belong to the Madrid-Washington group. It's no secret. We're the ones who launched the peace process, actually. We're the ones who wrote the peace initiative and convinced the PLO that we need, as people under occupation, to rise above our pain, our sense of victimization, and so on, and reach out even to our oppressors and say, we will make peace, we want to make peace, but it has to be peace with justice. And we were, of course, buttressed and empowered by the Intifada, the first Intifada, which was an expression of the spirit of the people who refused to succumb to oppression, whose spirit was not broken, who were determined not just to survive, but also to be free and to have the triumph of uh, human dignity and uh, justice. There were two different logics. logics. Our logic, our agenda was very clear. Ending the occupation, exercising our right to self-determination, our right to sovereignty in the Palestinian state that is, of course, contiguous and viable, resolving all issues, dealing with the core or central issues immediately, uh, which are the components of the conflict, in a comprehensive and integrated way, and of course, in an open and accountable approach. We clearly stated that there are two simultaneous interdependent processes, nation building, peacemaking, institution building, and peacemaking. And these two must proceed simultaneously and at the same pace, because you cannot have peace if the Palestinians are deprived of the elements, components of nationhood and statehood. And you cannot have a nation, a state, under occupation, given the fact that we are not in charge of any of our land or resources or even our rights. So we, we saw in this initiative as a way of bringing about an end to the occupation. We called it openly the devolution of occupation and evolution of statehood. And that's how you end up with uh, justice. And the justice requires a basis, which is international law, international humanitarian law, and of course ensuring accountability for the Israeli occupier and protection for the people under occupation in accordance with the law, nothing unusual. Particularly given the fact that we do live in a power imbalance, this is not a conflict over borders between two neighboring states. This is a situation of occupation, uh, where at a certain point we call it a situation of captivity and enslavement, and where one side has all the power and the other side has little if any objective power other than, let's say, moral, legal, human uh, power. So given this power imbalance, given this asymmetry inherent in the occupier-occupied paradigm, with military control on the one hand and power politics, and with people who are uh, totally 
at the mercy of the occupier. We said that any peace process must address and redress this imbalance, this disequilibrium, and we sought not just international law to prevail, but also that we needed third party participation and a multilateral approach. We asked for a binding time frame and for clear defined objectives, assurances and guarantees, as well as mechanisms for arbitration, monitoring, verification, and so on. And we also sought very consciously to build and maintain the people's ownership of the process. We wanted a constituency for peace, because if you don't have an ownership by the people, if they don't know what's happening, if they do not shape the agenda themselves, then they will not support it, and it will not have the legitimacy of uh, its own constituency. And of course, we were, as I said, empowered by the Intifada itself. Unfortunately, what has become known as the Oslo process negated its very own, its own requirements for success. First, by becoming, uh, by being a, a secret channel. So things were negotiated in secrecy rather than publicly. And we ran the risk of doing that again because John Kerry wants very much to have these talks in secret, no discussions over content and so on. And the only person who is qualified to speak is John Kerry himself about the substance. So right now you have most public opinions totally in the dark with you know, rumors right and everybody trying to manufacture what, what is going on, and those of us who receive the most of the world, the senior house, are not at liberty even to talk about the sanctions negotiations. So we've lost our constituency for peace very clearly, but uh, <coughs> not just as a result of secrecy, as a result of a long history of uh, negative experiences. And of course, the Oslo uh, agreement was signed in the dark with no legal, professional, or technical expertise. And that's why you have the, the Israeli side with all the, the uh, sources of power and control and the Palestinians sort of relying on the goodwill of, of uh, their occupiers. And instead of addressing the core issues, the causes of the conflict, which were defined later as the permanent status issues, Jerusalem boundaries, refugees, uh, settlements, security, water, and so on. Instead, all these issues were postponed without any uh, assurances or guarantees, except with an American letter, which I'll talk about later. And the Oslo agreement focused on peripheral issues, technical issues, and side, and side issues, thus adopting what we call the functional or administrative approach rather than the territorial approach. And to us, the issue is really territorial. It's one of rights, of course, it is one of freedom and, and dignity and self-determination, but the Palestinian people need to be free on their own land and to restore their land to their own sovereignty. I remember in the 1980s when uh, the military governor, Menachem Wilson, offered us all the functions of the civil administrations. He said, you can run your schools, you can run your hospitals, correct your garbage, we said, yes, we're perfectly capable of doing that, and we can, but we don't need to be administrators under the occupation. We need to get rid of the occupation so we can be free to build our own state. Unfortunately, Oslo adopted this functional approach, administrative approach, and ended up with the Palestinian leadership gradually becoming administrators under the occupation, with the occupation redefining itself uh, and again, we'll talk about that later. There was an argument at that time that all you need to do is improve that quote unquote quality of life for the Palestinians. I'm sure you've heard of the quality of life argument. Uh, you know, economic well being and uh, give them passes, let them work in Israel, and so on. And they will be happy in their captivity. And ironically, the Intifada took place, the first Intifada, when the economic conditions of the Palestinians were at their optimal conditions, were at their best. And uh, when Palestinians felt that they needed to be free of their captivity, and it's not, and we redefined what we meant by uh, quality of life. Now we are running the risk again 
with the carry approach of the $4 billion investment fund promise, which is you need to help the Palestinians and uh, the donors have to provide these funds and so on, and uh, talking to the Arab uh, uh, world to, to invest in Palestine for $1 billion. But the question is not investment. This is a bottomless pit. For the last 21 years, the international community, the donors, have invested in Palestine, they've invested in peace, they've helped us build the institution, and we have them. But the thing is, so long as the occupation is there, whatever you put in will be siphoned off and will disappear because we do not control our land, our resources, our freedom of movement, even our people. So in a sense, whatever is put in cannot build a viable economy because all the requirements of a viable economy are entirely uh, being held by Israel. And another problem with the uh, Oslo process is that it led to the separation of the people from the land, especially Jerusalem. And I'll tell you why Jerusalem is lethal, because with the Palestinian Authority not having any control over the Palestinians of Jerusalem, it meant that we were at the mercy of the Israeli occupation. They transformed all of us into residents, and at any point they could revoke your residency or your Jerusalem ID, so you become not just stateless, but you go into limbo, where you have no identity and you cannot stay in Jerusalem, with all sorts of draconian laws that we can talk about later. But this separation of the people from the land ensured that Israel maintained control over all strategic issues, and we, of course, had control over all technical and, and administrative issues. And another problem with the Oslo process is the phased approach, gradualism, which led to, of course, prolongation and stalling, buying time to create facts by Israel, to preempt and prejudge permanent status issues, or final status issues, particularly the settlements, with an ongoing land theft, confiscation of resources, annexation of Jerusalem, and, of course, creating a, a demographic, territorial, cultural, historical transformation of the city to suit uh, the Israeli narrative, what we call the forgery of Jerusalem. And, ultimately, the temporary became permanent. When the um, Israeli private sector or military started or continued with the, uh, the quarries in, in the West Bank, they, which is an environmental disaster, chopping away at the land, stealing the rocks, the stones, not just the water. Uh, the, there was a lawsuit taken to the Supreme Court in Israel, and the Supreme Court ruled that we are still in the transitional phase, and therefore in the transitional phase, the Palestinians have no control over the resources or land, and therefore it's perfectly permissible for the Israelis to continue to uh, set up uh, quarries and to steal these uh, stones and so on. So the transitional phase became a permanent phase. It was supposed to end in 1999. The Palestinian state was supposed to be declared in 1999. And here we are in 2013, still in the transitional phase. So whatever was temporary became permanent. And of course, there was an absence of any intervention or any accountability, whether it's legal, moral or human, and the process itself became an objective, an end unto itself rather than a means. I always uh, uh, quoted Dennis Strauss, I was very happy. So long as there were people talking to each other, that's fine. There's a process going. So I said, you know, so long as there's a process, then God's in his heaven, all is well with the world, and uh, Israel can build settlements and create flags and so on. The process itself is the important thing. And now we have Martin Inver, who belongs to the same school, of course, as Dennis Ross. And uh, he attended half a meeting so far, even though we were told that the Americans will be on board and will be engaged. Again, we'll talk about that later. So Israel, with the process, bought not only time, but also immunity to act with impunity, particularly given the unique relationship it has with the U.S. And the U.S. role is the decisive factor in this case. 
because when we talk about the US, we're not, we, we said, we, when we talked about a third party uh, engagement, we didn't mean this to be a euphemism for the US. We wanted a multilateral approach. It brought its strategic alliance with Israel to bear on the negotiations. And of course, we all know the components of the special relationship. It is not just billions and billions of dollars that go to Israel, and tax-free dollars, of course. And they are given an actual cash and without accountability. But from our experience, that no issue pertaining to Palestine itself will be brought to the Security Council. There will be no vote. And if there is a proposal, then the US would water it down, dilute it till it becomes meaningless, and then either abstain or, or veto. If it is not meaningless, of course, they will veto any uh, UN Security Council resolution. No public criticism of Israel, no sanctions of Israel, no censure of Israel, no surprises. This is very important. Any American policy position or American document was always cleared up with Israel ahead of time. We understood that this uh, went back, this goes back to the days of Ford, not just uh, the uh, Bush, Clinton, and so on administrations. But every document, every American document we got was cleared up with Israel first, and much of its substance and its language was Israeli and it adopted the Israeli approach. So we kept asking them, where is the American position? Where is the American language? Where are American interests? So that was another component. No surprises, as we said. And uh, uh, they, they became, as, as Adam Miller said, the, the peace team, the American peace team, became uh, lawyers for the Israelis rather than intermediaries or rather even handed peace brokers. And I, said here that uh, I don't think we can, by any stretch of the imagination, accuse the US of being even-handed in this process. So in dealing with Israel, as usual, there was no pressure at all. All the pressure, faced with the intransigence and with the refusal, with arrogance, with refusal to cooperate, the Americans would turn around and put pressure on the weaker side, on the Palestinians. And that has been a pattern that has been detrimental to peace and to the standing of the Palestinian leadership. Um, until now, right now, I mean, look, when, when Obama started, and I don't want to talk about this for long, but when he started talking about uh, a peace initiative and about his, the Cairo speech and how this is a priority and so on, he uh, sent a signal that this is uh, something that he will do on the basis of priority, on the basis of uh, recognizing the requirements of, uh, of peace. He sent George Mitchell for one whole year, and the position was that no settlement activity, no settlement expansion. Huh? For whatever reason, George Mitchell, the famous author of the uh, Mitchell document, came to the region for a whole year. He was trying to persuade the Israelis to stop settlement activities. They said, no, he said, okay, what else can we do? And then they turned around and told the Palestinians that we're the ones who have to comply, we have to work within what is possible and so on, because it's impossible to stop settlement activities. Well, to us, settlement activities are antithetical to the requirements of peace. How can you have two states if one state is stealing, stealing the land of the other? So again, pressure is always on the weaker party. Right now, uh, John Kerry put pressure on the Palestinian leadership to go back to negotiations without assuring us of the 67 boundaries, which are the negotiated terms of reference, without Israel cessation of settlement activities, which are antithetical not just to international law, but to the requirements of peace, without assuring us that Israel will comply with all the signed agreements that we had signed earlier. And unfortunately, again, we are seeing the same mistakes being repeated. So the US also historically became self-effacing from the process. They left a political vacuum, and as usual in our part of the world, 
political vacuum is filled with violence and extremism. Even the letter of assurances that we got in 1991, when the time came for it to be implemented, they told us it has no relationship to the, to the peace process, that it is something that the Americans you know, sort of adopt, but anything that the Palestinians and Israelis agree to would be fine with us. The letter of assurance talked about no unilateral actions, no settlement activities, particularly in and around Jerusalem and so on, but that was not brought to bear. Now instead we have this mantra that we cannot want peace more than the parties. Of course you must want peace more than the parties because there's one party that we see is doing everything to uh, undermine the chances of peace. And uh, only direct bilateral negotiations can work. Well, we are the only people who are being asked to get our occupiers' permission to be free. We want to negotiate, yes, but we want to address this situation and to have serious uh, efforts at ending the, the uh, occupation's attempts at sabotaging these talks and trying to get some sort of level playing field. And the American position on issues like the war, like, like the settlements and so on, uh, have eroded gradually through the years. The, the Americans also, through the process, uh, the Oslo process, maintained that only the Camp David Accords were relevant until uh, they accepted the two-state solution. But they were talking about uh, Camp David, the Egyptian Camp David talks, about self-government or autonomy for the Palestinians, rather than statehood. Now, given the fact that the process incorporated rather than addressed the, the power imbalance, and given the U.S. bias, and given the fact that Israel is a domestic issue in the U.S., we decided that it mustn't be either unilateral, because unilateral means Israel is in charge, nor bilateral, because of the power asymmetry, but multilateral. And we asked for the international community to be engaged. So in 2002, the U.S. created a very strange creature called the Quartet, uh, in which you have the Americans, the Russians, uh, the Europeans, and the U.N. engaged. And the Quartet, again, became a sporadic instrument for American engagement. Whenever they were busy, they would tell the Quartet, why don't you go and play for a while? Maintain, make sure that there is no breakdown or breakout of violence. Gradually, uh, as the process gained a life of its own, with no substance or credibility or relationship to reality, it began to generate a negative dynamic of distrust, of hostility, and victimization on both sides. It also lost its con uh, constituency and allowed the occupation to reinvent itself as an unaccountable system of control with full authority and no responsibility. It became not just not costly as an occupation, but it became profitable. And they had the international community funding this occupation, and they had the Palestinian Authority making sure that the functional uh, tasks are taken care of, while Israel had military control, economic control, control over all our lives. And of course, nation building cannot proceed with such control because you, there are limits to how far you can build institutions and statehood under occupation without freedom. And this led to greater extremism and violence, several stages, and different cycles of violence and revenge, in addition to the fact that the Palestinian question remained an open wound and therefore was used by extremists throughout the region or the world. And we said it must, the Palestinian question has its own integrity and must not be used, must not be up for grabs for anybody to use it to gain legitimacy or reconstituency. Another problem was the focus on security. And it was defined as Israeli security and it was defined in military terms rather than human security, economic security, social security, and so on. And it became a prerequisite for peace rather than an outcome of peace. Security generally is an outcome of, of uh, just peace agreement, but 
In our case, it became a prerequisite. You have to guarantee, we as Palestinians have to guarantee our occupied security in order to prove that we are good little boys and girls and that we can have uh, an agreement leading to peace. And not just that, but there was a repressive attempt, and it is still being repeated now, that land is a source of security. So Netanyahu is saying, how can we give back land given the nature of the transition of the Arab world? We need land for security, as though we are dealing with infantry or cavalrymen or so on. These days, you know, wars are done, uh, they cross borders, they don't need territory. And if you steal other people's territory, that's the sure way of being insecure and of generating more conflict and more hostility. So ultimately, if you use that logic, then you need to take more and more land. And it seems to me Israel will end up taking all the Middle East, because that's where you need, you need more land for your own security. But modern warfare, so to speak, and especially now that we have seen uh, nuclear weapons and different uh, weapons of mass destruction in the region. It's not territory that gives you security, and in many cases, keeping control of other people's territory gives you serious insecurity. And this kind of process had its impact on Palestinian domestic internal realities. It transformed us internally, whether politically, economically, or socially. The return of the PLO, or the Palestinians in exile, the leadership in exile, was seen as something very positive, and it is positive for the Palestinian people. But at the same time, now the national leadership of the Palestinian is living under of the Palestinians is living under occupation, and so it lost its freedom of movement and its representative uh, capability to represent Palestinians everywhere. So it created a very strange relationship between the leadership and the people because more than half the Palestinians are living in exile. And so to come to the West Bank and Gaza and to run the lives we established the, the Palestinian Authority as a form of government or governance, that meant that the Palestinians in exile and the refugees and so on felt that they had no direct representation. And the constraints of occupation made it difficult for the PLO to represent all Palestinians. Uh, and of course, gradually, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, uh, became more powerful than the PLO because it had institutional control. It had, of course, the donor funding. And, uh, and the attempt from the beginning by, by the international community was to get rid of the PLO. Now what they did was they weakened the PLO to the point where now Palestinians are talking about the need to upgrade, revive, and reform the PLO in order to have it regain its representative uh, capabilities. And uh, of course, the PA has to be redefined in terms of its relationship to Israel, rather than serving as a, a provider of, of security and, and so on for Israel, and security control and economic control, that it should, in a sense, turn towards its own people. So that's another problem. And the whole economic situation shifted. We have a serious uh, number of civil servants and security personnel who are entirely dependent on their salaries from the Palestinian Authority, which means that they have a vested interest in keeping the system going, which is a source of weakness. Because uh, if, if you threaten them with the loss of donor funding and so on, loss of livelihood, you have at least a million and a half Palestinians instantly without an income. And all the, the changes, the, social, the socio-economic changes that took place uh, on Palestinian society as a result of the return of the leadership and the new economic conditions meant that we had what is called the market economy and people are in debt. They started, this wasn't part of Palestinian culture, but now people are buying installments, apartments and houses being mortgaged and so on. And so they, uh, in a sense, their, their future is dependent on maintaining this kind of situation. Uh, there is a dependency, of course. Um, the Palestinians, once again, have been placed on probation or on good behavior. We have to prove that we are worthy, that we deserve a state. And one thing that has been used against us was the fact that there is uh, an internal rift, which we will talk about, 
the fact that the PLO and the PA do not control all of Palestine. And that source of internal weakness has also led to the undermining of uh, Palestinian standing and the cause itself. We underwent a series of agreements, partial, piecemeal, but all these agreements were more honored by the breach than by the implementation, whether we're talking about Taba or Y River or Sharm el Sheikh or the roadmap or the Hebron protocols. The one thing that Israel implemented was unilateral and it backfired, which is unilateral uh, withdrawal or uh, redeployment from Gaza. Um, other adverse developments, of course, that plagued the process itself within the context was assassination of Rabin, the breakdown of Camp David talks, and of course blaming the Palestinians, the 2000 Camp David talks, the Sharon incursion in the Haram Sharif and the breakout of the Second Intifada, the reinvasion of the West Bank in, two, uh, in 2002, the death or assassination of Yasser Arafat in 2004, and then you have the uh, election of Hamas 2006 and the military takeover of Gaza, which led to the split that I talked about, and the suspension of elections, which affected the legitimacy of our whole political system uh, with internal divisions and with violations of human rights and rule of law. On the Israeli side, you have the number of settlers quadrupling, quadrupled since we started the talks. The wall of separation and annexation was built, leading to an apartheid system. The superimposition of a grid of infrastructure on the West Bank with clear extraterritoriality from Israel to the settlements. The annexation and transformation of Jerusalem, which is besieged in three ways with settlements, with checkpoints uh, and uh, with the wall. Gaza continues to be under a cruel siege, of course with sporadic bombing and shelling and, and uh, invasion. With an attempt by many Israelis to link Gaza to Egypt and the West Bank to Jordan, again, which is another problem. Within the Israeli body politic, we are beginning to see the rise of extremism in the government itself. This coalition is made up of the right-wing uh, ideological Likud partners along with the racist parties like the uh, Lieberman uh, party or hardline uh, or, or settler uh, uh, parties like uh, Tari Bennett's party. So now you have the settlers in the mainstream as part of decision-making and in serious uh, positions. While at the same time Netanyahu is talking about wanting unconditional talks, he has introduced his own conditions of recognition of the Jewishness of the State of Israel, where he says they want to annex all the major settlement clusters, they want to control uh, the Jordan Valley, they want to control entrance and exits to the Palestinian state, they want to keep Jerusalem, annexation of Jerusalem, and the refugees have no rights whatsoever. And he says, then let's talk about everything else. So having negated unilaterally all the issues of permanent status, he wants to talk about peace or about a state-led he said, you can call it a state, population centers isolated and so on. You can call them a state, but without sovereignty. Now let us talk about in Israel about a one-state solution from government ministers in the coalition. Talk about the annexation of all the land, extending uh, uh, Israeli sovereignty and control, annexing it all, and at the same time, making the Palestinians of the West Bank politically responsible before Jordan and the ones in Gaza before Egypt, while Israel would exercise uh, sovereignty. And of course, it's attempting to redefine uh, regional relations and threats by presenting Iran as the real strategic threat to the whole region, huh? and the Palestinians as an internal domestic issue that Israel can control. So given all these, we see ourselves in a triple liability with the Israeli role, the, the US role, and the Palestinian uh, weakness, all a result of the uh, Oslo logic or lack of it. 
The current uh, configuration and context, of course, is different from that of 1991, while at that time, of course, it was the end of the Cold War and it was the end of the, uh, it was the invasion of Iraq and so on, post-Iraq. And now we see the Arab world in a period of transition. That's a whole topic that can be discussed the uh, so-called Arab Spring, and a very painful, disruptive, unpredictable uh, transition that has turned the Arab world to become more inward-looking and has sidelined the Palestinian question, I would say, temporarily. But this is different in the long run. There are attempts at reviving the Arab Peace Initiative, which Israel uh, totally ignored. Uh, Kerry wants to use it, and he has brought together the uh, Arab representatives, but at the same time he's managed to get concessions from them for Israel. Because as usual, you put pressure on the Palestinians, but you give Israel advance payments and rewards and positive inducements. So he wanted the issue of swaps to be adopted by the Arabs, the land swap. Um, the second question is, is this initiative a total initiative of the American administration? Obama yesterday said yes, that he's committed to uh, peace, but, uh, or is it a, an attempt by John Kerry himself uh, to try to come up with a solution, even though he's using the, the same pattern of behavior? We as Palestinians and Israelis uh, have conducted and invented more types of negotiations than anybody in the world. <laughs> really, we've been negotiating ad nauseum. We've negotiated direct negotiations, indirect negotiations, uh, uh, proximity talks, long distance talks, uh, exploratory talks, even epistolary talks. We exchange letters. <laughs> and now, you know, he said, let's do preliminary talks. After 21 years, we're doing no preliminary talks. <laughs> But all these talks have led us nowhere because they lack the ingredients of success. That's the problem. It's not talks for their own sakes. We keep saying negotiations are a means, they are an instrument. If the instrument is flawed, either you fix it or you throw it out and you find something else that can function that can work. That's why we went to the UN. We went to the UN because we wanted to give people hope that if these flawed talks are leading nowhere and they're very costly, there is another peaceful, responsible, moral, legal way of holding the occupation in check and holding Israel accountable and getting international intervention. Uh, instead of being recognized as such, we were faced with tremendous pressure threats, blackmail, as though we're breaking the law because we want international law. And it's no secret, what we wanted was to define our territory, the 67 boundaries, as boundaries, Jerusalem as our capital, that this is occupied, not disputed territory. That's why there was a hysterical reaction in Israel and the US, because Israel did not want this land to be defined as occupied, and did not want the fourth Geneva conventions and other laws to apply to, to this territory and did not want to have Israel held accountable, especially if we join the ICC or the ICJ and we recognize the, or we accede to the <coughs> Rome Statute or we join the high contracting parties of the Fourth Geneva Convention. These things threatened the fact of the occupation itself, that it has been proceeding for all these years creating facts unilaterally on the ground, changing, transforming demographic and territorial realities with no accountability. This kind of impunity now is being threatened. That's why the first thing that John Kerry asked President Abbas was to suspend any effort to go to the UN, to uh, accede to uh, international agreements or conventions, or to join international agencies and organizations. So now we have a six to nine month period in which we have become a do nothing people. The leadership is supposed to do nothing. Don't go to the UN, don't hold Israel accountable, don't rebel. And uh, at the same time, 
Israel is still continuing, not only continuing, but it, since the Kerry Initiative, it has stepped up its settlement campaigns, its land confiscation, its home demolitions in Jerusalem, its eviction of Palestinians. And of course, Area C, I'm sure you remember, I said we were inhabiting, we were living in a land that has historical, cultural names and meanings and so on, and suddenly, after the, the uh, interim agreement, we found ourselves inhabiting letters of the alphabet. <laughs> areas A, areas B, areas C. A is under Palestinian control. Uh, B is under Israeli security control, but Palestinian administration. C is under full Israeli control, and that is 60% of the West Bank, which meant Israel gave itself the right to take over 60% of the West Bank under the guise that it is Area C. So now they are totally evicting and they are destroying whole population centers, whole villages uh, from Area C and bringing in uh, Israeli settlers. These things have escalated and intensified since the uh, Kerry Initiative as a direct response to Kerry, and yet, Nobody is reacting or saying this is antithetical or detrimental to peace. But the Palestinians, if we go to the UN, or if we even join CEDAW or 1325, or the Convention on the Rights of the Child, this threatens the security of the region, or this is bad for the state of affairs of the peace process itself, while we want to ensure a global rule of law. So we, we're looking now at game changers. We need a corrective move. We need a serious paradigm shift. And we cannot continue with the same business as usual. Uh, I talked a bit about the, the US attempts. I don't want to uh, go into details. But let me say that what we're seeing now to Palestinians is a continuation of 47, 48. What we're seeing is what Ilan Papi calls the displacement replacement paradigm. And if this continues, then the chances of peace will be totally destroyed. Now, Ian Lustig, I think uh, last week, 10 days ago, wrote a, a, an interesting article in the New York Times called The Two State Illusion, in which the whole concept of two states is being used as a way of preventing the achievement of any agreement rather than the achievement of an agreement. It's an interesting thought. The Palestinians have several uh, options or issues that we are working on. I believe we should work on internal empowerment. I believe we should heal the rift. We should work on a system of good governance. We should change our relationship to the occupation. We should work with international solidarity movements. We should focus on nonviolent resistance. And of course, since the boycott, divestment, sanctions, uh, and sanctions movement is a civil society initiative, this is something we support, but we cannot uh, take over. The uh, process itself is flawed, but the objective remains no less noble. That's why, um, even though my message is not one of, of supreme optimism, it is very realistic. And I believe now is the time to come up with creative solutions and to overcome and undo the damage of the past by thinking outside the box. Many people are talking about, about a one-state solution. Perhaps that should be the topic for the discussion tomorrow, because the one-state solution might become a de facto outcome of what is happening now. But the thing is, if it is a one-state solution, it means perpetuation of the occupation for a long time to come. And if there is a chance of a two-state solution, how do we carry out this paradigm shift to change the whole approach to peacemaking and to understand that there is parity before the law and that we need to have a global rule of law? Thank you very much.
And there's two microphones on either side. Um, if you want to ask a question, step up to the microphone and we'll just alternate between the two. Uh, I think we have maybe 25 minutes for question and answer. Can you step up to the microphone, please? Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, you said, I believe, that uh, a, a one-state solution would mean the ongoing occupation, that probably the West Bank Palestinians would have to live the way the Palestinians live within Israel today. I assume that's what you mean as second-class citizens. And yet, I'm aware of a, uh, a speaker, uh, Miko Pellet, an Israeli-American, and he has great credentials in terms of street cred in Israel, and he wants a one-state solution, but one that would be truly democratic. Mm -hmm. So, um, it was interesting that you see the one state as being a uh, step in a negative direction, whereas he, I believe, sees it as a step in a positive direction. Could you comment? Yeah. Thanks. Now, I, I know Miko Pellet, and he is a, a man of, of principle and tremendous foresight and insight. Um, when I talked about the one-state solution now, I said it is a, a de facto outcome of what's happening. It is not a political program that has adherence. The PNC adopted the two-state solution, as I said, in 1988. If we want to adopt the one-state solution, we have to reconvene our parliament in exile, change our strategy, change our policy. Maybe it's necessary. But to do that, you also need the international community on board. You need people on board. Uh, and you need to re-engage with Israel in a different way. Miko belongs to a, a very small minority in Israel that refuses, but right now there is a growing majority that wants a one-state solution in, in the form of greater Israel. You mentioned very significantly the Palestinians uh, of Israel, 1948 Palestinians. Uh, since 1948, they have been treated with such systematic discrimination, and they are now citizens of Israel in terms of the, 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 the institutions, the schools, the economies, and so on. And the lands have been taken away also. They've been restricted to uh, very small ghettos and areas. And there are discriminatory laws about whom they can marry and so on, about where they can live. So there's a very intricate system of discrimination and racism pertaining to Palestinians who are 20% of Israel. If you're going to have all the Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza and Jerusalem become citizens of Israel, I don't think that you will get citizenship. As they say, they can, Israel will extend its sovereignty over the West Bank, but will not give citizenship to the Palestinians because we happen to be Christian and Muslim or whatever, but non-Jews. So it means that citizenship will be reserved for uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, members, but Palestinians who are not Jewish cannot become citizens. So how can you know? Your struggle will be to ask for one person, one vote, hmm? to ask for civil rights, when you're not even citizens of the state that is occupying you and that is taking over your land and your territory. Most probably you will end up, and I'm looking at it realistically, with a perpetuation of the occupation, taking over more land and more resources, <coughs> making life as difficult for the Palestinians as possible, which is what Shamir said, fill the West Bank with settlements and settlers, make life difficult for the Palestinians so they will exile themselves. This is called the silent transfer. Israel is not a neutral observer or bystander watching us you know, sort of increase in numbers. And frankly speaking, I do not like the argument of, not Nicole's, uh, Pellet's argument, but the argument that we threaten Israel with a one-state solution, knowing that 
there will be more Palestinians, that we have more children than they do, and, and by 2030 there will be more Palestinians, more non-Jews in Israel than Jews. I think that in itself is a racist argument, and it is used to scare Israel, those who want an exclusively or purely Jewish state. And I find it also sexist, because I don't think this is a race between the Israeli women's womb and the Palestinian women's womb. <laughs> <laughs> you can have more children, and therefore it's not a demographic race. I think it's a question of rights. It's a question of humanity. It's a question of, having, of ending this occupation, which has poisoned both societies, both peoples, and the whole region. So let's end the occupation, then if you want to re-engage, let's re-engage as equals. This is my solution to the one-state solution. End the occupation, let's have our state. Then re-engage as equals, not just Palestinians and Israelis, but maybe Jordanians, maybe Lebanese, maybe Syrians. Nowadays, in the future, is looking more and more towards regional cooperation and regional bodies rather than discrete entities of nation states a la 19th century. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I do believe that once you end, once you end this occupation, you get rid of this lethal factor that has been injected in, in our body politic and throughout the region. But to start talking about a one-state solution, yes, it is a reconfiguration. It's rebooting the whole region, the whole reality. But can you do it? And can you do it in a way that would not give Israel more control and more means of transforming us into temporary residents in, in our own land and taking over more land and more resources and ending the chances of a Palestinian state or Palestinian freedom, let's say, and, and religion. So it's, it bears discussion. I'm not saying it's negative, but I'm saying there are different ways of looking at it. And I really don't think Israel is going to be neutral and watch us outgrow the Israelis or watch us build our own institutions and our own means of uh, uh, redefining uh, the state. So if we re-engage, we re-engage as equals, but not as people under occupation. Thank you. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the role of Hamas in the latest round of negotiations. To what extent have they truly been given a seat at the table, recognized by both the United States, by Israel, uh, by the PLO, as a part of the solution, uh, as a necessary partner? Yeah. No, Hamas is part of Palestinian political realities. It is part of a pluralistic Palestinian system. That's how it should be. Hamas should be part of the PLO collective, which is a representative body of all the political parties and movements in Palestine. And the only way for Hamas to be part of this is to have elections, and to have elections that would include Hamas and Islamic Jihad and others who are not part of the PLO. There's no reason why they should continue to be excluded, or they excluded themselves uh, at the beginning, but now, with this lift, it's very important that Hamas understands that it is part of this uh, inclusive Palestinian pluralistic system. It is not a substitute or an alternative to the PLO, but rather it should be part of the PLO. Now, we're not telling people you should go talk to Hamas in the same way as Israel doesn't tell you know the Americans go and talk to every single party, including the most serious uh, racist parties and so on. No. If Hamas is part of the political system, then whoever represents the Palestinians will talk on behalf of everybody, right? But it's not the fact that Hamas has to be addressed separately or distinctively that will solve the problem. Now, Hamas has a different political agenda, and it's perfectly legitimate for it to have a different political agenda, but it has to accept, again, the rule of the majority, and the majority has to accept the rights of the minority. So the only way, as far as I see, although there are voices now saying, no, we need a, a political agreement among ourselves because it's <coughs> difficult to have elections, and that sometimes elections can be uh, divisive in, in situations of occupation. But I believe, no, we should have elections because that 
restores legitimacy, vibrancy to our political system, and also brings in Hamas through the democratic path rather than through the military door. Thank you very much. Uh, in passing, you mentioned uh, the nonviolent uh, movements going on. And I, I visited um, both Israel and the Palestinian territories a year ago in February, and one of the things that surprised me most was how dominant that was and how little Americans know yeah. that there is a very deep nonviolent um, civil society movement. So I wonder if you could say a little more about that and whether you think it's gaining strength, particularly among young people. Yeah. No, you're right. People keep associating the Palestinians with terrorism or violence and so on. It's a very easy label when historically most of our struggle has been nonviolent. The first intifada was and other intifadas before that. But this movement now is a total commitment by not just the young, but even the different political factions and parties and so on. It started against the wall, demonstrations against the wall, with Israeli and international solidarity <coughs> movement participation. And it's growing in terms of not just numbers, even though there are difficulties, but in terms of its creativity, like building uh, villages on, on territory that Israel is annexing. Um, pitching fence and starting to build, and then the army comes and kicks them out. But there are different ways of showing Palestinian persistence, the spirit of resistance. And it is something that Palestinians are committed to. Uh, the response has been extremely violent in many ways. As you know, there were many in Belain, Alin, Nabi Saleh, and other places where the uh, people were killed. Uh, the demonstrators, the protesters were killed. The use of live ammunition, the use of uh, tremendous force uh, against them, and some internationals were also killed. But uh, this is a matter of conscious decisions by the different uh, organizations as well as by the young now. There is a, a rising movement among the youth to try to change the approach to the way in which we deal with uh, the occupation and to try to work out uh, new forms of solidarity and new ways of nonviolent resistance, <coughs> even though it, we are faced with, with violence. The problem is the redefining of the occupation in many ways has placed the Israeli army at the entrances and exits of towns, cities, and villages. So it's very hard to mobilize people to come to nonviolent uh, demonstrations and protests, number one. And number two, if you want to face the army, you have to go to them because they are not there. They only come into the cities when they want to arrest people or demolish homes or uh, whatever. So uh, the whole relationship with the occupation has been redefined in a sense. But areas that are suffering from the wall and areas uh, in which you have uh, people who are trying to save territory, uh, these are the finding creative ways of nonviolent resistance. And I think you will see this movement growing more and uh, taking on more recruits. Thank you. Sorry, I was Hi. listening to um, So I just had a question concerning, you mentioned earlier about one of, how one of the fatal flaws of the Oslo process was its secrecy from the people. And I'm wondering, how exactly do you see this process, or what um, Kerry has restarted, being more inclusive of Palestinian, the Palestinian con con constituency as well as the Israeli constituency. And then my second question off of that is, do you see that as perhaps opening the door, at least in Israeli society, and even in Palestinian society, to the negotiations being controlled by the popular will, or being, you know, you have events like in Hebron where someone is shot and that sways popular opinion to one direction. If you keep them completely open, what do you see? Do you see events like that having an impact on the situation? Yeah, events have always had an impact on negotiations. But the thing is, if you have a clear purpose, if you have a clear timeline, and if you know where you're heading and there are clear terms of reference, then you will not be deflected by uh, events. 
you might suspend talks here or there, or you might uh, wait a bit, but it doesn't mean that they will change course or change direction. The thing is, you need to be able to have a constituency. And if you work in secret, which is what happened uh, with the earlier, uh, the DOP, then it means that people feel that this is not that. I'm not talking about populism. I'm talking about the people's right to know, the people's right to participate. This is shaping their future. You cannot wait and say, OK, we will have a referendum at the end, which is what both sides are saying. There will be a referendum at the end. But the thing is, people want to shape the agenda. When we were negotiating, we would go home and we would have town meetings. And they would feel that they have the right to tell us what to say, how they felt, what are the issues that are important to them, and they wanted to know what happened. There's nothing wrong with that, especially when you know that negotiations do involve compromises. But you have to tell people honestly what is happening and what the compromises are or what is being asked. But if you wait to the last minute and then sign an agreement and say, here it is, take it or leave it, that's when you, you will run in, in trouble. And that's when you, don't, you haven't prepared your people uh, uh, for a constituency of peace. Now, the problem with the, the talks now is that when you don't talk, when you don't, so you just say there are serious issues being discussed. And I know what is being discussed. Huh? And I know what the problems are in the room. And we are not allowed to talk about them. Hmm? And when I know that the Palestinians have been shortchanged when it comes to settlements and terms of reference and signed agreements, which are the three things we wanted. I know that Israel is building. That's what people see. They see on the ground more settlements, more land confiscation, more evictions, the wall being built and continued, and so on, more control. And they say it's more of the same. So how can you have a constituency? How can you have people say this is not just our process, but this is our initiative, this is our endeavor, and we will make it work. Now, the problem is violence has been used repeatedly. The problem is it doesn't become visible except when the Palestinians use violence. But when the Israeli army uses violence, and that's, it is really enormous, like the, the uh, incursions uh, over Gaza and so on, then people notice. But daily there are Palestinians being, uh, being killed, daily. Hmm? And that is not seen as violence, because there has been a devaluation of Palestinian lives and, and rights. However, the violence becomes an issue when an Israeli soldier, for example, was killed. Then Mahmoud Abbas is held responsible. Uh, a soldier was killed, you must uh, denounce, you must denounce terrorism. This is the, but when the Israeli army kills Palestinian civilians and children and so on, it doesn't matter because it's not front page news. This kind of imbalance has to be addressed, uh, by the way. No, I am not saying that make the talk subject to the whims of, of you know, people and change them every day. But if you have terms of reference, clear objectives, binding time frame, international law is the basis. That's it. Then you can move ahead rapidly. And you need serious mediation, and you need serious arbitration, and you need what we call mechanisms of monitoring and verification for negotiations to ensure that people are in compliance. Then you will get somewhere. But you don't go on fishing expeditions. You don't negate the terms of reference. You don't negate the signed agreements. You don't act in ways that sabotage the talks and say that's OK, so long as we are talking, it's fine. That's the problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hanan, I would like to greet you in Arabic and say mahabeki and, and uh, chakna. It really is a great honor to be in your presence. Thank you. My I really appreciate that despite the odds, you have come with a basically an optimistic message or to say that uh, one should never give up hope uh, in, spite of, in spite of the facts. And I just want to say, I think you know that the American people are uh, fair-minded people. And that uh, most of the problem here with the not giving enough support to the Palestinians is because of the overwhelming ignorance of what is, is going on in the, uh, in the under occupation and that the media has a certain bias although that has been corrected to a, a certain extent. And I would like you to comment about that, but I would also like you to consider, in light of your request for some creative uh, 
uh, ideas, uh, that Americans have been responsive to fair trade coffee, uh, to support the rights of indigenous peoples in Guatemala or in Central America. They've been supportive of conflict-free diamonds when purchasing uh, wedding rings. Mm -hmm. uh, some years back, we had a Palestinian support group at another institution, not Brown University, I don't know, I'm sure they would want to have one here as well, uh, where we were able to sell a small amount of Palestinian olive oil, and it was a hot item. We were selling uh, about a liter of Palestinian olive oil for $20, uh, and they were going like, sorry to say, hotcakes. <laughs> And I wonder if, in the spirit of these creative re new relationships mm -hmm. built on nonviolence, built on cooperation between peoples, there might be a way to uh, have a channel of Palestinian olive oil uh, with an educational label in the back, you know, how this is produced, Palestinian dates, Palestinian uh, oranges. Uh, I, I think there would be a market for this. I'm sure there would be a market for this, but we just need to find the uh, the, the creative ways to make this happen. I agree. I think that's wonderful. The, the problem is we still, I mean, the, the crossing points and trade and so on are still being controlled by Israel. But I think it's a very good uh, approach. People to people approach in terms not Palestinians and Israelis sort of meeting, but international solidarity. Um, I agree with you that Americans are motivated by a sense of fair play. And many times I have a feeling, and, and they tell me, how come we didn't know? And once they know, they want to do something about this. Um, and especially now with the social media, people are gaining access to the facts, to what's happening more than before, where mainstream media had its own agenda or uh, their own agenda or uh, their own extra grind. Now people can see firsthand, whether through uh, you know, YouTube or, or Twitter or Facebook or whatever, but there are people who are taking the truth to people's own homes and, and awareness, and that's very important. Uh, that is changing. So people are not dependent, Americans are not dependent on mainstream media only. I've, I've watched domestic CNN, it's amazing how there's nothing about the world or the, the <laughs> network news, there's nothing. I mean, that's more, it's becoming more entertainment, but now that people are plugged in and the electronic uh, information age is, is taking over and the uh, IT revolution is taking over. It has worked in favor of the truth and therefore in favor of the Palestinians. Uh, movements like the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement, BTS, was an initiative of solidarity people and of groups and of civil societies where they felt if governments couldn't do anything, then the public can. The public can initiate uh, boycott and, and uh, divestment from uh, any kind of investment that uh, supports the occupation and so on. And you have that in church groups, for example, you know, the Methodists, I think, uh, I don't know if the Episcopalians did that, but several ch church groups, trade unions, the retirement fund in, in Norway, for example, uh, divested and so on. So it is possible. Lately we've had the um, uh, European uh, guidelines on settlement products and settlement institutions and organizations not being uh, given uh, the, the preferential treatment that Israeli uh, products and, and uh, uh, produce have. So there are initiatives like that and I agree that if you work with Palestinians directly through different channels and solidarity movements that a lot that can be done. And it is not just uh, helpful to the Palestinians, but it is also educational, as you said. There are many initiatives, and they should be made more known so that people can participate. Uh, hello, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Hayward Leach, I'm a senior concentrating in comparative literature, and I'm constantly trying to understand as I entered into my last year how I'm supposed to connect comparative literature to my own interest in the current day. And I'm curious to hear how your own training in academia and comparative literature specifically influence your current yeah, political work. <laughs> Look, I, I always say sometimes you don't choose to be uh, in politics, but reality <laughs> intrudes. No, it's true. I mean, I would 
I would love to just be in, in academics. I would love to teach and to do my own research and to be in such a, a wonderful atmosphere where you can afford to do these things. But I have to say, when you're a Palestinian, you are born with a responsibility and with a historical burden. Nobody reacts to a Palestinian in neutral terms. Hmm? When I was a student, I thought about this. People, if I'd sit on a, on a plane next to somebody and say, I'm a Palestinian, he would be this, are, are we going to get there, or are you planning to hijack a plane, or <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Or there's no such thing. For a long time, people told us we didn't exist, so we had to prove that we existed physically. Um, and living under occupation meant either you acquiesce and, and you know, you die accidentally or you take chances, you take risks. Now being an academic, so it trains you. It trains you to question, it trains your mind to be critical, it trains you, it trains you to make comparisons, uh, it trains you to look beyond the, um, the obvious and to look for solutions and to take responsibility. And to me, uh, teaching is a tremendous responsibility because you're engaging other people's minds. And what you put out there is something that can influence behavior and influence others. Uh, so that, that uh, in a sense, helps you take responsibility for your own actions, thinking critically, thinking uh, in, in new ways, in creative ways, and with a sense of responsibility that there are so many things that are uh, negative and out of your control that you have to take initiatives and you have to uh, become part of shaping reality. Literature makes you gain awareness of reality, right? But taking part in shaping reality is something that uh, goes beyond just observing and, and uh, criticizing. I, I don't know how it, uh, it trained me, but it trained me also to be able to stand up and speak out, not to be intimidated. And that's important. And to understand that even though we have an inequality in, in power, we do have an equality of rights. And an assertion of humanity is, is very crucial in politics. Thank you. Um, I think you just answered my question, <laughs> because my question was, and I think as it, it is affecting how students think about majors and so forth, so I still want to uh, ask you, and maybe you could develop it further. You are an extraordinarily powerful spokesperson for the Palestinian cause and for peace. Your reasoning and, reasoning and intellectual power could run circles around most people trained in the war and disciplines more relevant to what you do, political science, law, whatever, but yet you are trained in literature, and you just, you spoke to that. But I wonder if you would comment even further on how your academic training in literature has helped, perhaps, sustain your courage and your stamina as you pursue these goals. Well, before I did, I did the comparative lit, but I also am a medievalist, so I know old English, and I am attracted to esoteric um, <laughs> topics. Yes, I, I was telling people I'm one of the few people who know old English, but I'm probably the only Palestinian who knows old English, <laughs> and Latin and Greek, and all the dead languages. But sometimes it's escapism. No, it gives you tools of, of handling things. Assertion of humanity, as I said. Uh, and the ability to, to inquire, to go beyond things. Uh, to me, as a faculty member, I, I wrote about this, we were, I was responsible for many students. I saw students being killed. Some of my students were killed on campus in front of my own eyes. I wrote about cradling the head of a dying student, and I didn't believe that this was a role of a, a dean. I never thought that this is what my job is, or setting up first aid stations when the army came and besieged the campus and so on, or treating wounded students, or going to court, or uh, uh, once I was arrested with my own students. So 
I'm not telling you that being here you can do the same things because you're not subjected to the same intrusive realities that we are subjected to. So I had to form the, the, the uh, Legal Aid Committee for students. I had to do all sorts of things that people in academia and other settings don't have to do. But we do have to do these things. And then when the time came, uh, we were working underground, all of us politically, and when the time came to set up a political committee to see uh, visiting uh, uh, politicians or to oversee or to work out political programs or to meet with um, James Baker and, and before him we refused to meet uh, others. Anyway, we, we had to come out, we had to form these committees and, and work. Being a Palestinian means you cannot afford to separate the different compartments of your life. You have to be an integrated person because the occupation is the most intrusive and pervasive form of oppression in every aspect of your life. The important thing is in resisting it, you don't dehumanize yourself. In resisting it, you don't adopt the methods that are used against you. You don't say, you know, I will do unto others what was done unto me. You say, that means that I claim the higher moral ground and I see how I can change and transform reality. So uh, maybe that's the academic training. I don't know, maybe <laughs> it's happening. But to think critically and, and uh, to have the patience and to try. For example, every single Secretary of State I've met, I said we, we have, we're busy educating different secretaries of state. So maybe an educator is always an educator. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the propensity, uh, propensity to lecture all the time, and 50 minute uh, uh, lectures and so on. But we drew our negotiating team from the universities, because we didn't have professional politicians. We don't think of ourselves as professional politicians. I've run for every single office I've held from the days of the student union till now, and I've won every election. But to me, that's not being a politician, that's having the legitimacy of being elected, of, of having a constituency. So, uh, and, and Palestinians under occupation view authority with suspicion, with a great deal of hostility, because the only authority we had under occupation was the Israeli military. And we were busy resisting the Israeli military. So when we set up our own authority, we wanted to make this as human, as immediate, as direct, and as uh, responsive to the people's rights and needs as possible, even though many mistakes were made. But this was my job. I mean, this was part of our job, to hold whatever political authority we had accountable. Maybe the last question? Yeah, I think the last question. Uh, Dr. Ashkawi, um, you had mentioned that uh, the region is turning uh, inward as a result of the, mm. the situation. And um, Palestine is not on the front page anymore. Uh, but you said specifically that that is a short term yeah. thing. Um, I'm curious about uh, the, the publicized aspects of uh, Palestine, where Palestine fits into the Arab uprisings. What we know about that is really the stuff that makes the headlines, is namely like that Hamas, for example, that had a much publicized break with the Syrian regime. We don't hear so much about what the other side of the rift, how it sees itself fitting into the kind of mind-bending transformations, both in Egypt and in Syria. I'm curious about what you, where you see yourself on that question. No, first of all, I do think that undergoing such a transi transition is an extremely difficult process for the Arab masses, for the Arab people as a whole. It's not that easy, as you know, and some of it has become extremely violent and extremely painful. And sometimes, you know, the people who brought down the, the system are not the ones who uh, organized on the ground, those who mobilized in cyberspace and managed to uh, go out and demonstrate and bring down the regime, did not organize to be able to bring out the vote and to take over the uh, uh, system. But, uh, and, and in many places, those who did manage to create another autocratic system, sometimes absolutist systems, yes. Uh, we, our official position in Palestine, I can tell you the official, I can tell you 
The official position is that you do not at all ever interfere in domestic politics and whatever is happening internally in the Arab world. The, the statement is that we support and respect the will of the Arab people. That's it. The will of the people, the rights of the people, and so on. I personally believe that uh, the, regardless of how painful and destructive the so-called Arab Spring was, it was a necessary step, and it is necessary, because for a long time the Arab the Arabs people have been under such autocratic dictatorial systems that the people had to find their voice, had to rebel. Some of the immediate consequences may be painful, some may be uh, disruptive in, the, in their own rights, some may lead to wrong conclusions. That's, that's uh, expected after years of oppression and, and uh, suppression. But this transition is a necessary transition. Once you go to the other side of this transition, you will have genuine respect for the people's will, genuine democracy, not just in terms of elections, but respect for rights and freedoms and good governance and rule of law and so on. And it has debunked many myths about the Arabs, that they, don't, they, they lack a democratic gene or that they are born with an extra violent gene and so on, and they are all extremists. But, uh, the Palestinians have sympathized with the people all along. They have sympathized with change. Uh, the Palestinian Authority has tried to maintain, or the PLO officially, to maintain a situation of non-interference precisely because we have Palestinian refugees in almost all of these, in all the other countries. And these, it's like having hostages in these countries. So far we've had the, what, about uh, 8,000 Palestinians killed, I think, in Syria. And the uh, Yarmouk refugee camp is a disaster, and it's become uh, fighting grounds. And uh, in Egypt, the Hamas relationship with Morsi and so on led to the uh, Palestinians of Gaza suffering as a result. Of, so we kept saying, do not interfere, do not take position, do not side, respect the will of the people, yes but do not take sides in support of one or the other because the hostages that you have in, in these countries will pay the price. It doesn't mean we do not have a principled position. We do, but we are not willing to come out and fight on behalf of one side or the other, and we do not believe that uh, such uh, a position can serve the, the Palestinians. I personally believe it is an important transition once we get to the other side. Palestine will continue to be a very uh, visceral core issue in, among the Arab people, the Arab public. It is not something that will disappear. And so whatever leadership emerges as a result of this democratic transformation will be a leadership that is more sensitive to its people, regardless of how long it will take. And I've always associated the cry for dignity, not just internal dignity in the Arab world of the individual, but also the Arab dignity that is constantly being challenged by the ongoing indignity of the occupation. And that will be rectified in the future. Thank you.